Okay, what's up everybody? Good to be back. I've been off the grid for a couple days there between getting busy with some other things and just kind of needing a little bit of a recharge after that whole leprechaun. But it's nice to be getting back at it again as ever. And today I'm just going to be giving you my thoughts on a movie that is available to stream on Shudder, released in 1984, called The Company of Wolves. This was directed by Neil Jordan and written by Jordan and Angela Carter based on her own short story. Now Neil Jordan is a filmmaker most people will probably associate with The Crying Game, a movie that came out back in the early 90s, and if you haven't seen it, it's a good non-horror film for every horror fan to watch. And not just because of the twist, because kind of like my friend JT mentioned in his review of Psycho, that twist with Norman caused so much uproar and hysteria and just general conversation and buzz that at this point people have had that ending spoiled without even ever having seen the movie. In fact, if they've seen anything, they've probably seen a spoof of it in some form before they've seen it in the original movie. And the big secret in The Crying Game was much the same way. It was a target of so much just controversy and chatter and disbelief at the time that it ended up overshadowing just how well this movie functions as a thriller. Like, the suspense in this movie is absolutely fantastic. But that's not what most people remember it for today, unfortunately. But in any case, that made me very intrigued to check out this movie because one of the issues that I have with werewolf movies, as much as I kind of like them, is that it's a genre that is very stubborn when it comes to sticking to the very traditional lore when it comes to werewolves. You don't really see many movies step outside the box, like, at all. So with Neil Jordan being the kind of filmmaker who knows how to take a familiar genre and kind of shake it up and make it feel a little bit unique. I had faith that this wasn't just going to be an ordinary run-of-the-mill werewolf movie. And it's not really. Like, this is essentially a supernatural sort of gothic fairy tale, reimagining Red Riding Hood as a fantasy horror. The movie opens up with the character Rosaline in the present, or at least what would have been the present up until that point, locked in her room in bed, fraught with nightmares about being in the 18th century and living in a village that is plagued by wolves. From there, Rosaline has to go visit her grandmother, of course, well played by Angela Lansbury. And throughout the course of the familiar journey about her fateful trip to Grandma's house, we get a few more stories therein that are told by Rosaline and other characters that kind of make this function as a vague anthology. Each bedtime story that the characters tell each other about wolves is fully visualized and experienced on screen. And while the story within a story within a story structure can kind of make you feel a little bit disoriented at times, it is also kind of fun to take a little trip down that kind of a rabbit hole, and it makes it feel that much more like you are getting lost in Rosaline's dream the whole time. If you want to get really technical and scrutinous about it, yes, you can definitely point out that the character development and the story development do kind of leave some things to be desired. However, if you're the kind of person who has patience for films by guys like David Lynch, I think that you'll be a little bit more partial to just watching this and just kind of abandoning yourself to the experience. And that's a very happy abandon when that experience is this atmospheric. Like, this movie has atmosphere up its ass and up your ass to spare. The production design in this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, is it technically a little bit dated? Sure. But it's one of those things where, while you know that what you're looking at is artifice, you can't see the seams. And Neil Jordan and his team are always very careful to make sure that all the same visuals look the same and stay consistent throughout the story. Everything is designed with that same very sort of classical perfectionist sense of attention to detail that I would associate with some of the old silent films like A Trip to the Moon. It's like watching a storybook come to life right in front of you. Trees, the village, the mist, the omnipresence of creatures big and small crawling and creeping everywhere, and a great underlying score that only draws attention to itself when it really wants to. And there's some great gliding camera shots in here that are calibrated at just the right rate to add to the whole dreamscape atmosphere. You can tell that the cinematographer definitely studied giallo because that's a genre that helped innovate that whole style, even though it doesn't get the credit for it that, quite frankly, it deserves and has deserved for a long time. And not only is the atmosphere and the whole world always very enveloping, but it also manages to be just vaguely foreboding, just foreboding enough to keep you kind of on your toes the whole time you're watching it. 
The same way that John Carpenter did a really good job of creating a tense, foreboding atmosphere in the early passages of The Thing, before you even see the alien, like just the way that he would place the camera and light certain scenes just gave off this vague sense that there was something getting ready to happen just beneath the surface. And Neil Jordan achieves that same effect throughout this movie, even in some of the slower passages. I mean, you might not always be expressly interested in the details of every story, because again, it can kind of feel like a little bit of a blur at times with the whole dream thing undercutting everything. But you always get this creepy, snaky vibe that something is going to happen at some point, and it just keeps you sort of engrossed as much as it also makes you feel a little bit sort of scared and chilled. Just to go off that note that I mentioned about the omnipresence of nature, I think that one of the big details that separates this from other werewolf movies that I've seen is that they focus squarely and starkly on werewolves being fully wolf when they're in their final form. This isn't one of those movies where they transform into a human-wolf hybrid. The werewolves are either completely humanoid or, you know, completely wolf lupinoid, I want to say. If I'm getting that wrong, I'm sorry. I'm no scholar. But you know what I mean. Like, in their final form, they are an animal, and an animal that we recognize, which makes it a very intriguing thing to watch. They alter their appearance just enough by lighting up their eyes in nighttime scenes, and even just vaguely in scenes where their faces are a little more lit, so that they look just vaguely supernatural, but with an emphasis on natural which would be for naught if they weren't able to coordinate and choreograph these wolves. But whoever was the trainer and handler for these wolves on set, I hope that they got a raise because the way that they are able to coordinate these wolves to do things that feel supernatural and calculated and vaguely spooky and threatening is amazing. Like every time they sort of start to roll down a hill in a pack or they would all raise their heads or all look the same way at a certain time and you would see all their eyes light up. Like, honestly, man, it just gave me chills. It was so cool. I'm sure it must have taken a lot of time, but I'm really glad they went through the effort because it gives these werewolves a certain gravitas and more mysterious quality that I haven't seen elsewhere in a werewolf movie. Other animals and creatures are put to good use too. There's a scene early on where Rosaline takes a bite out of an apple that's fallen off a tree and recoils when she sees a worm writhing around inside it. And for all I could tell, that was a real worm. And there's little details and moments like that with everything from spiders to chickens just kind of sort of peppered throughout the movie. You just get this subtle underlying sensation that everywhere you look, the nature that this human species is trotting upon is still teeming just beneath the soil or in the trees or in the forest or even maybe in the sky, threatening to rise up and reclaim the natural world at any second. Their supernatural potency is implied almost entirely through their omnipresence, just to use that word again. Yeah, sometimes I'm real redundant, but hey, what can I say? Here, the supernatural in nature is produced and occurs whenever humans come into contact with it. I really like that sense of chemistry to the lore. And the werewolf transformations in this movie are absolutely fantastic. Well, maybe there's one that feels like it kind of cheats a little bit. It's the one that occurs when that pregnant lady returns to the wedding in the story that Rosaline is telling her mom at one point. But other than that, these transformations are on screen, in camera, visceral and completely practical. And I think out of all of them, my favorite is probably the very first one we see during one of the stories within a story where a disappeared husband played by Stephen Ree returns and ends up essentially ripping off his entire scalp and face and skin right in front of his wife. And you get this skinned wolf roaring at her in sinew form before his hair finally grows in. When he tears it off, it's a genuinely visceral moment because the brooding, threatening atmosphere has been constantly building up to a boiling point to prepare you for it. It also actually stings and cuts deep a little bit in terms of the story because at that point he's transforming into the wolf for a reason a very specific reason, and not just because the full moon is out. The second big money shot comes when the huntsman who's been going after Rosaline transforms into the wolf at Grandma's house at the very end. First his eyes start to light up with that weird glow, which you've seen a couple of times already by this point in the movie, but then once the beast within, so to speak, is released, the werewolf's snout just launches out right through his mouth, and his jaw just springs open like a reverse bear trap, 
and his whole face is contorted and his eyes are squinting and you've got this raw, wet snout just poking out all teeth. It's the image that was featured prominently on the posters and the home VHS. I know this because I saw that VHS cover many times in the store as a kid and it was one of those covers that I would always just sort of peer at very sort of like fearfully but with this morbid fascination I could not look away but it was just so surreal and gross and scary that I did not know what to make of it like this was one of those things where I was like man if I watch this movie I'm gonna die like this wolf is going to eat me I don't ever want to see this or do I well fast forward 30 years later and yes I definitely do want to see this and I want to see it again so while this is not like the most gory or violent horror movie on the whole again it's much more about anticipation and atmosphere and suspense than it is about direct gore and violence so if that's what you're looking for or if that's sort of the flavor that you like in your werewolf movie you're not going to get a whole heck of a lot of that here that said where it counts in terms of giving you those vicious visceral money shots this movie absolutely works now you may like me sort of leave that last sort of werewolf encounter wondering how rosaline gets over the death of grandma so quickly i mean when this huntsman werewolf confesses that he killed her grandma like she barely even seems to register the way she reacts it's almost like all he did was confess to double dipping her salsa or something like that but the way it ends with her transforming into a werewolf might suggest that she was always latently a werewolf to begin with which is why this doesn't really sort of phase her and would also explain why she is drawn to all the dangers of the forest that everyone including her grandmother are repeatedly warning her about but again i think it's kind of cool that you can interpret it your own way because they do essentially leave details like that up to your interpretation it is honestly much the same way that when you were read fairy tales or a bedtime story when you were a kid the point of those stories isn't really to tell you what to feel the point of those stories was to allow you to experience an adventure in a fantastic realm and then leave you to come up with how you felt about it or at least that's the case with the good fairy tales and bedtime stories, if you ask me. And this movie functions the same way. It's essentially a bedtime story for adults, and there is nothing wrong with that in my world. The atmosphere alone and just the sheer experience of how this movie looks and feels is strong enough that I will definitely be adding it to my collection at some point, and it's definitely going to enjoy some rotation on my Halloween watch list this coming season. So if you're the kind of person who has a hankering for films with the kind of atmosphere that peak era Ridley Scott and Tim Burton were able to conjure up, combined with the slightly darker and more grisly aesthetic of a British Hammer horror film, A Company of Wolves is a very unique and distinct werewolf movie that I think that you'll enjoy. Anyway, that's all I have for today. Thanks for joining me out on the beach here for this particular video. Something about this movie just made me want to take a walk and sort of like brush up against some trees and brush. Stay tuned to the channel for more content really soon and I will catch you all later. Have a great day.